I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Greetings and salutations and welcome to another fabulous day in the Lord's neighborhood and another episode of Coffee, the Bible, and Paige. I'm Paige, your caffeine imbued host. Here's my coffee. Mm. The Lord invented the coffee bean and lo, it was declared to be very good. Today we're going to do something a little different. Uh, instead of going to the next chapter in Numbers, um, I feel compelled just to stop here for a second today and to do some heavy-duty thinking about some stuff. You know, the purpose of devotionals is for you to see what God has to say to you when you're reading the Bible. And it's appropriate that I do what I do today because God has been given, God has given instructions to the Israelites about how they're to travel how they're to walk, not only just the direction they're supposed to go, but how they're to follow him. And his direction basically involves if the cloud stays in one place, they stay in that place. When the cloud lifts and moves, they get up and follow the cloud. Sometimes they'd camp two or three days a month, perhaps in one area. Some days it would be a day or two. But regardless, when God tells them to camp, they camp. When God tells them to move, they move. Well, God, I believe, has told me to camp today. We're not going to go to chapter 10 of Numbers yet. And here's why. I mentioned it in yesterday's devotional, how um, it grieves me what Israel is getting ready to go through. You know, I've read the story. I've read the books. I've read through the Old Testament. Uh and I've especially read through this part of the story that's coming up. And I always used to have a, a it used to be a point of <sighs> malicious pride, I think is what I would call it. I'd look at what Israel's response to God was and just shake my head. Those poor disobedient Israelites, don't they know how great God is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. God showed them all the signs and wonders in Egypt, when Moses had the showdown with the Pharaoh and his music and his magicians, almost said musicians, magicians, different kind of magic. Um, and I saw what happened when Moses took them out of Egypt, took them to the Red Sea, Pharaoh and his army coming down on him. God stands between Pharaoh and his army and, and Israel, and Moses raised his staff, and Israel saw the Red Sea part. And they walked across on dry land. Then they saw the Red Sea fall down and onto the army of the Pharaoh, destroying the Pharaoh's army. They made it to Mount Sinai where they heard the voice of God speak to them audibly. They saw God manifest himself. And yet while Moses was up talking to God and getting the Ten Commandments written on tablets, Israel produced a golden calf and said, this is the God that took us out of Egypt. They went back to their old ways. Moses comes down, of course, takes care of this situation. And, and then we start seeing a cycle presenting itself. God manifests himself in powerful ways. And for a moment, Israel is obedient and compliant. Not long later, Israel starts rebelling 
And we're going to see that time and time again as Israel journeys to the promised land. And so knowing that ahead of time, when I read yesterday's uh, scripture that talks about uh, them being obedient to God in the beginning here as they're getting ready to march, I grieved because I know what's coming. And, but the part that hit me hard was the realization that Israel is a perfect picture of Paige. I'm not going to point any fingers at anybody else here, pointing them at me. Israel, for whatever reason, could never shake loose of their desire to go back to the old ways of doing things. We're going to find out when they complained about manna. And they said, whoa, I wish we were back in Egypt where we had onions and leeks and blah, 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 blah. At least we were fed there. And they were tired of manna. And that's what they wanted. Um, And when they get into the promised land, we know that they're going to demand that God give them a king, just like everybody else. God didn't want to give them a king. But he gave them a king. He gave them what they wanted. And they got Saul. And I'm telling you, Saul was no treasure. And they just, you just, you're going to see the cycle. Well, I see that cycle in me. There are areas in my life that continually come up to haunt me. There are areas in my life that seemingly I am unable to defeat. Like Israel seemed unable to defeat this part of their nature that complained and rebelled against God. There's areas in my life that I just, for whatever reason, cannot overcome. And there, and I was so hit by this picture, the fact that Israel is a perfect picture of Paige as an analogy. Um, I grieved. And I so identified more with Paul when he says in Romans, oh, who shall save me from this body of death? He said, I know what I should do, and I don't do that. I know what I shouldn't do, and I always do that. Who shall save me from this body of death? And sometimes, in this past couple days especially, it's like I've been so overwhelmed with my incredible lack of ability to overcome areas in my life. It's like I get frozen in place. And it's not even easy to pray anymore. It's kind of like I don't want to read the Bible because I'm guilty of being page. Some people have called that uh, the paralysis of analysis. Where you analyze something and you get so overwhelmed by what you find that you can't even move forward. When I was growing up in Alaska... I used to make my brag about what I would do if I encountered a brown bear in the woods. Well, there came a time when I encountered a brown bear. And you know what? I was frozen in my tracks. The brown bear is the apex predator. Paige ain't the apex predator. If that bear had wanted a meal called Paige, he could have had me. I was frozen in place by fear. And by all that I knew about the brown bear. And I realized I was not capable of defeating that brown bear. No, I was frozen in place. And there's sometimes when I look at my life and I, I, God has done great things in my life. I Like Israel, I have these signpost moments along my life where God showed up in extraordinary and powerful ways. And I rejoiced. And I can look back at those times and, and I realize that God is with me. But then I look at certain areas in my life that don't change for whatever reason. And I'll sometimes I'll be so overwhelmed by that. And that, this happened this last couple of days. So overwhelmed with it that I was frozen. No original thoughts in my mind for prayers. And... So today's devotional is kind of like dealing with that. What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you pray 
when you don't know what to pray? What do you say when there are no words? I get tired of telling God, God, I'm sorry again for knowing that tomorrow I'm going to be saying, God, I'm sorry again for... (sighs) It hurts. And it shames me. So what do I do when I don't know what to do? Well, when I was getting my master's degree in music composition, my master's thesis was on that topic. What do you do when you don't know what to do when it comes to composing music? And I came up with a process that I use to get the inspirational juices flowing for composing. And I'm to the point now where I can sit down and I can start, even when I'm not inspired to do anything, I can start and before long, I'm back in the groove and I'm writing, composing. It happens every time now. I'm not afraid of that blank piece of paper, music paper in front of me anymore. And sometimes it's an adventure when I don't know what music is going to come out of me. But I I, I learned what to do when I don't know what to do as a musician. But as a Christian, what do I do when I don't know what to do? What do I pray when I don't know what to pray? What do I say when I don't know what to say? I'm going to share that with you. And it comes from uh, my observations and studies of of an ancient Christian um, custom called the Mass. Now, back in the 5th, 6th century, there was only one church. Now, we call it the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church, but there was just church. There wasn't a division between Protestantism and Catholicism. And the church came up with something called the Mass. And there was... The ordinary of the Mass and the proper. The ordinary of the Mass is the part of the Mass that is sang or spoken every time the church would meet together for worship. The proper of the Mass would be the portion of the service that would be customized to whatever holiday, season that they were in. So, But, but no matter when you went to church, what part season you were in, what holiday was being uh, celebrated in the church, there was still the ordinary of the Mass. And in my studies of that, I discovered my secret for what do I do when I don't know what to do? And I will read these sections of the ordinary of the Mass. And as I become more and more familiar with them, I'm starting to memorize them, that becomes my prayer. When I don't know what to pray, when I don't know what to say, this brings peace. Because the ordinary of the Mass contains all the elements that we believers need to remind ourselves of. That's contained in the truth that God has implanted in us. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to read through the text of the ordinary of the Mass. And it's split up into sections. And uh, I think it would behoove you to go and look for the text from the ordinary of the Mass and read for yourself these things. Perhaps print them out. Perhaps have them available when you're overwhelmed. Now, my Protestant friends, brothers and sisters, If you feel you have an ax to grind with the Catholics, get off your high horse. This isn't Catholic dogma. This is truth. And please remember that the Catholic Church is where we came from. Now, I'm not a Catholic, and I do have issues with Catholic theology. That's why I'm not a Catholic. But I will not belittle them. I will not get on my little Protestant high horse and wag my finger at them. There is much truth to be found in the ordinary of the Mass. And I don't care what your faith tradition is. This would behoove you to read this stuff. So what do I do when I'm overwhelmed? And what have I done this last couple days when I'm overwhelmed with just the enormity of my sin and my inability to be anything other 
than what I see happening with Israel? Here's what I do. Let's take a look at it. It starts off with the Kyrie. And it's a simple little prayer. It's a prayer of the penitent. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. There it is. Sometimes when I'm tired of asking for forgiveness, what I really need is mercy. God, please give me mercy. I'm, please, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. That's easy to memorize. And I say that prayer a lot. Then the following on the heels of the Kyrie is something called the Gloria. Now, the Gloria is worship. Glory be to God in the highest, on earth peace and to men of good will. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee. Now, I'm going to turn this into personal. Glory be to God in the highest, and in earth peace to men of good will. I praise thee, I bless thee, I worship thee, I glorify thee, I give thanks to thee for thy great glory. My sinful condition has no bearing on this prayer. This is a prayer sometimes of faith. Or maybe I'm not feeling overwhelmed with glorious religious thoughts. But nevertheless, this is the cry of my heart. I praise you. I bless you. I worship thee. I glorify thee. I give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, thou that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon me. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, receive my prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of the Father, have mercy upon me. For thou only art holy. Thou only art the Lord. Thou only art the Most High, Jesus Christ, together with the Holy Ghost, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. That's a good prayer. Then the credo. This is what we believe. This contains the basic elements of the tenets of our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And I will turn this into a personal prayer. Lord, I believe you're one God. You are the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. <laughs> you are the maker of all things visible and invisible. Lord, you I believe in the one Lord, Jesus Christ. That's you, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of light, light of light, God of God, light of light, true God, a true God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation descended from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man. Lord, you were crucified for us, for me. You were crucified for me. You suffered under Pontius Pilate and was buried. And on the third day, you rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven. You sit at the right hand of the Father, and you shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, and your kingdom shall have no end. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified as it was told by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. That's not the denomination. Catholic just means universal. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I await the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Everything you need to know that summarizes this, what we need to know about God and the scriptures is contained in the credo. That means that's our creed. It's what we believe. Then there's a sanctus. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. It's not hard to memorize, is it? Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And Agnes Day, Lamb of God, 
That's what it means, Agnes Day. Lamb, Day, God. Lamb of God, who takest away the sins of the world. Have mercy upon me. Lamb of God, grant me peace. Oh, I pray this. And I've been praying this this last couple days. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on me. Lamb of God, grant me peace. I need peace. I need the peace that comes from knowing that God has granted me mercy. I need the peace that comes from knowing that this God, whom I proclaim as Savior, has indeed saved me. I need peace. Then the Benedictus, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. I personalize this and ask God, let this be true of me because I come in the name of the Lord. I'm walking in the name of the Lord. In the world around me, which is hostile to me, I stand for the Lord. Lord, I stand for you. In my sin and in all the contradictions that is called page, I stand in your name. I come in the name of the Lord. Bless me, Lord. That's it. That is the ordinary of the Mass. Did you see anything Catholic in here? I didn't. I saw truth. And when I don't know what to pray, I pray elements of this. When I don't know what to say, I'll say this. I don't know what to think when I am overwhelmed because I've come face to face with the apex predator of my life, sin, like me with the brown bear. And I'm frozen in place and I don't know what to do. I do this. Again, the purpose of a devotional is to come face to face with God but also to come face to face with you, yourself. And that's what's happened to me in this last couple of days. And when I'm frozen in place, like that young teenager was when he saw his first brown bear up close, I've been frozen in place this last several days, realizing the despair that is Paige, realizing that for all that God has done, I still, like Israel, want to run back to the old ways. And in my grief, I'm frozen in place when I realize that in some respects, though I've made so much progress in my life and I'm so different than I used to be, in some respects, I'm still the same. I have this element of sin in my life, like Paul, and my cry is, who will rescue me from, the, from this body of death? I read this. And I'm telling you the truth. The Kyrie, I pray that every day. Just like it's written. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Kyrie, eleison. Christos, eleison. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Tomorrow we'll pick up where we left off in Roman, uh, Romans, in Numbers chapter 10. Uh, but I just, God said camp. So I camped here today. Have a grand and glorious day. This is Paige. Here's my coffee. Have a great day. Bye-bye. God's thoughts are not our thoughts, neither should my thoughts be your thoughts. 
you need to think for yourself.